do a presentation in Canada, and now you're internationally renowned. <laughs> <laughs> so I did live in Canada for a few years, and very much enjoyed that. Uh, thank you for coming. Thank you to Megan and Mary Beth and Jim for doing our, our videotaping today. So it's nice that that will be up on the website. So if you want to go back and you've forgotten something or some information, um, you'll have that. Uh, Megan was kind enough to do the, the handouts uh, for you as well, so you have that resource. And I, you know, I've got the, the PowerPoint slides up here and all that. I'm doing the formal presentation. But as we go, if you have questions, just let me know. You'd be happy to you know, stop and address that because my guess is if you have a question, somebody else has a very similar question or the same question. So we'll try to do it that way. So we're just going to jump right into it. So we're going to start with some definitions. Again, many of you are familiar with this. But you know, obsessions are these intrusive, unwanted. They can be thoughts. They can be images, so pictures in your head. They can even be urges or impulses to do something you don't want to do. Jump off a balcony. Uh, hurt somebody, again, even though you don't really have that desire. Uh, these aren't excessive worries about things that we would normally worry about. People who worry, uh, all of us included, will worry about things like finances and relationships and world affairs and things like that, things that are pretty common. And people with OCD will acknowledge that the thoughts that they have are really kind of silly or senseless, weird. That's usually the terminology that they use. They recognize there's something fundamentally different about them. These thoughts produce a great deal of distress and anxiety. And so as you experience that anxiety, you want to do something about it. And so generally, they'll do different things. They'll try to avoid the things that bring on those kinds of thoughts. If I had a fear of contamination, you know, touching doorknobs, which is fairly common, I'm probably going to just try to avoid touching them, right? I'm going to use my sleeve to open the door. I'm going to wait for somebody to go through in front of me so that I don't have to come in contact with that door or other surface that I think is contaminated. Distraction. It's not uncommon for our you know, kids, our smaller kids and teenagers to engage in you know, watching a lot of TV, playing a lot of video games like Minecraft and things like that, because it's a way for them to think about something else other than those intrusive thoughts. Or probably more commonly, which you're more you know, familiar with, is those kind of compulsive behaviors, things that I do as a way to ease the anxiety that those thoughts produce. There are different kinds of obsessions. Probably the most common are obsessions related to things uh, uh, like contamination. So uh, germs, so chemicals coming in contact with an animal or insects. Uh, sticky substances. And oftentimes it's not even that there's necessarily a, a terrible outcome that will happen. It's just people will describe feeling yucky or disgusting coming in contact with certain things. They don't like the feel of those that contaminant on their hands or their body. Uh, fear of harm or danger, so something terrible will happen to somebody that I love. I have these bad thoughts that you know, my parents will get into a car wreck or something will happen to my significant other. A fear of loss, so do I have everything in my backpack, do I have my books and my cell phone and all those good things that I need to go to work or go to school? I need to have things just kind of so, symmetrical, organized. So having all my books organized in my room, having my stuffed animals on my bed, just so, because uh, that's the way I need them to be. And if they're not that way, I'm going to feel pretty uncomfortable about that. There's also a need for perfectionism or a need for certainty. And oftentimes, people will describe this as a kind of just right feeling. I have to do something until I get a feeling inside that says I'm done with it. It's a hard thing for people to explain, but those of us who treat this kind of understand what that is. It's just an internal feeling of perfection uh, that they're kind of striving for. Now, compulsions are generally behaviors. They're things that we can observe and see. They're overt. But they're also covert, or oftentimes in our heads, that we call those mental rituals. So these are the things that I do over and over again. And generally, these are to reduce the anxiety that those obsessions produce. Right? So if I have a bad thought about coming in contact with a germ or something like that, I go ahead and I wash. And once I wash, and I may have to do it a certain number of times, I generally will feel better. I've uh, alleviated that anxiety. People also engage in compulsions to prevent bad things from happening. You know, if I say this particular prayer, if I repeat this phrase, it will protect my family when they're away from home. Um, generally, these are uh, done in response to an obsession. 
And oftentimes, as we said before, they'll have to be done according to some rigid rules or until it feels just right. You just get that internal feeling that it's done. So that could be, I keep checking the door until I get that feeling and then I can walk away. Examples, washing and cleaning, very typical, very common, probably the most kind, uh, common uh, compulsions that we see. Hand washing, grooming, uh, wiping yourself, all those kinds of things are common. Uh, checking, also very common. So I have to check things to make sure that I'm certain that, for example, the door is locked or that the stove is turned off, um, that the uh, light switches are off. I need to know and check to see that my my mom is okay when I'm away at school or something like that. Hoarding, right? So oftentimes this is a part of the presentation of OCD. Uh, I need to collect things. Maybe I have a strong attachment to it or feel like I might need it at some time, at some point in the future. And these can be things that we probably really don't need, but we just think, what if? What if I might need that? What if I could use that? Or maybe that object even reminds us of a happy memory of an event that we shared with someone. Ordering and arranging, kind of mentioned that already, having to have things just so. And then repeating rituals. I might have to repeat certain steps. I may have to repeat reading a sentence or writing something because I had a bad feeling or a bad thought. And I may have to redo it until I get a good thought or a good feeling, and then I can move on. So these things really do kind of go together. And our diagnostic manual right now says that you can have either obsessions or compulsions, and as I'll talk about, from our own experience, uh, we've looked at our the folks that come to Rogers, we really find that everybody has both. They really do present with both obsessions and compulsions, and sometimes it's maybe not quite as clear at times what the obsession might be, but it's, it's generally there. So what you can see in the relationship between these things, of contamination, cleaning, doubter, fear of harm, maybe checking things and making sure the stove is off, Symmetry leads to ordering and arranging, that fear that I don't have everything might lead to hoarding or you know, checking. Needing for perfection, that just right feeling or a, feel, uh, a compulsion of needing that reassurance. And then what I haven't really talked about are these what we call primary obsessions. Obsessions about um, thoughts related to violence or harm to other people, uh, sexually inappropriate kinds of thoughts, and also religious thoughts. Those tend to be the three categories where these kind of primary obsessions fall. And so in response to that, there may be repeating kinds of rituals, or as I said, those mental rituals, repeating certain words, phrases, or prayers in response to that. But we also see people who have those kinds of thoughts engage in good old thought blocking. I just don't want to think about it, or suppress the thought from consciousness, because it's way too distressing to, uh, to think about it. So <clears throat> as I kind of had mentioned, what we really have found from our own research is that people present with both obsessions and compulsions. When they initially come in, we find that they may not report having certain thoughts, and maybe only report compulsions. But as they get to understand the disorder, they generally then will recognize that they, they do have uh, intrusive unwanted thoughts and some sort of a compensatory ritual to reduce that anxiety or prevent bad things from happening. So we do know that, that OCD is quite common. Back Gosh, 25, I mean, more like 40 years ago now, I'm dating myself. Um, OCD was thought to be pretty rare, 0.05% uh, or something like that. Now we know it's about 2 to 2.5% of the population. It's also the fourth most common psychiatric condition in the United States, which is, I think, saying something. In terms of, you know, who gets this, male versus females, at least for this anxiety disorder, there just doesn't seem to be a big difference. Uh, it seems to affect men and women equally. The average age of onset is you know, roughly in the early 20s, which is also the time when other kinds of mental health issues kind of rear their ugly heads. Um, and roughly half occur by the age of 18, and rarely is a first diagnosis occurring after age 50. And certainly people will recognize that they have symptoms prior to that. And it's oftentimes the case that people report having these kinds of symptoms dating back 10, 15 years before they were diagnosed. So someone in their early 20s may say, yeah, I remember when I was 10, and I used to you know, check things uh, a fair bit, but that was maybe all I did. And it just was under control until it just got worse and worse over time. So there are a lot of associated features, meaning it's very sort of uncommon for OCD to kind of occur on its own. 
And that's often the case with other anxiety disorders and other mental health uh, issues. We often see a lot of people with secondary depressed mood. That kind of makes a lot of sense. By the time you're diagnosed with OCD, you're experiencing things like, this is taking a lot of time, right? I might be spending four, five, eight, 12 hours a day engaged in obsessions and compulsions. Um, and that may not be able to attend school, go to work, have meaningful relationships because my OCD is just getting in the way. How would you feel? How would that affect you? How would that affect your mood, right? So I think a lot of times, that uh, mood is secondary to all the problems that the OCD produces. As I mentioned, there's oftentimes the inability to really do school, to work, or to work really at your potential because the OCD takes up so much time. People often experience low self-esteem. They may not quite understand what's happening to them. They may feel badly that they're not able to control this. So they feel kind of bad about themselves. Certainly their social withdrawal. You know, there could be a lot of reasons for that. One is I'm embarrassed by my symptoms. Maybe it's also that there's a lot of triggers when I'm around people. You know, contamination triggers or thoughts that I have. And I just easier, it's just easier if I'm home alone by myself. A lot of family discord. And at the kind of the end of the talk, I'll talk about family accommodation. And family accommodation really does play into that. It produces a great deal of family dysfunction. Fear of embarrassment, right? Folks with OCD are really good about hiding their symptoms. Little kids less so, but adults definitely are pretty good at being able to hide that from family members. Um, it's amazing to hear you know, spouses and parents say, I have no idea. It's been going on for years, I have no idea. That's how well they were able to hide it. And certainly avoidance. I avoid anything that might bring on my, my thoughts and make me have to engage in my compulsions. There are a lot of other things that go along with this. And this is for kids and adults. Attention deficit disorder. So we see a lot of that in our programs, right? The inability to be able to concentrate and focus, kind of feeling that you're fidgety, can't sit still. Uh, tick disorder, so engaging in certain like movements like this, or verbal, like ticks, uh, uh, like that, is a tick that we will see in like, companies of OCD, especially in some of our younger uh, ch children and adolescents. Um, repetitive behavior disorders, uh, hair pulling disorder, or skin, uh, skin picking. Hair pulling used to be called trichotillomania, and thank heaven they changed it to hair pulling disorder. It's much easier to pronounce and know what the heck they're talking about. Body dysmorphic disorder is the kind of perceived imperfections in one how it looks. It can be their face, I don't like the way my nose is, or my ears, or my eyes, but it can include other body parts. It can be I'm just not happy with how my arms look, or my stomach, or whatever it might be. Certainly, anxiety disorders go together. Uh, the general rule of thumb used to be if you met criteria for one anxiety disorder, there's about a 50% chance you're going to be criteria for another one. So they, they seem to kind of share that kind of common ideology. We also have a lot of individuals who have got what we call pervasive developmental disorders, or kind of autism types of issues. Um, Asperger's no longer exists uh, according to our diagnostic manual, but really these are individuals who really have a hard time with social interaction, reading nonverbal cues. Um, they really just feel somewhat disconnected from people around them. Um, and so that can be very challenging for them. Substance use, right? A lot of people self-medicating. I don't want to have these thoughts. I don't want this anxiety. What am I going to do? I'm going to turn to alcohol. I might turn to marijuana as a way to ease those anxieties, reduce those thoughts. It makes sense, right? I mean, people will do what they need to to try to deal with this. Depression, I already mentioned. Learning disabilities. I've had individuals who have anxiety and their ability to process things is kind of slow. And so they're a few seconds or longer behind everybody else. What would your life be like if you were anxious and you, know, you were 20, 30 seconds behind everybody? You, know, you would really feel uh, disconnected. And certainly I work with a lot of individuals with eating disorders. About 30 to 50 percent of folks uh, with an eating disorder will have a co-occurring anxiety disorder. They really tend to go together to the point where we're really starting to think about eating disorders as anxiety-based problems. So the World Health Organization has ranked OCD 10th in terms of disability-causing conditions in the developed world. So there's a huge impact. Yes? A question. Mm -hmm. I don't know what DAD is. Yes. I don't know uh, what social phobias you're talking about. And panic, I think, is panic disorder. It is, yes. Okay. Good, good question. We get so used to doing that, you know, that's my fault. <laughs> All these acronyms, right? 
GAD stands for Generalized Anxiety Disorder, and it is one of the, the, the anxiety disorders as they're defined right now. That's really the worry anxiety disorder. Those are individuals who worry to excess about a variety of different things that all of us worry about from time to time. Finances, relationships, work, world events, things like that. Most of us, our worry is temporary or it's not too excessive and we can move on. For people with GAD, they worry a lot and it's very difficult for them to kind of turn it off. It also tends to be kind of long-standing, meaning that individuals have been worrying to excess for a long time. At least six months, usually by the time they come to see you, it's been a couple of years. So it's very distressing, it seems to be fairly persistent across the day, so these folks are really having a hard time. Um, panic is a panic disorder, which is that sudden increase or sudden rush of intense fear and discomfort, where people have that fight or flight response, where they're, you know, their heart starts beating real fast, they start sweating and breathing really heavy, it kind of comes on pretty quickly, peaks for maybe 10, 15 minutes, and then kind of goes away on its own. And the other one was social anxiety disorder, which is that uh, kind of excessive fear of embarrassment, where someone might evaluate you in a social situation, you might do something that would bring, bring on negative evaluation, or you might do something that would be really, really embarrassing or humiliating. Like right now, I'd make a huge mistake. <laughs> I would start sweating, and my face would turn red, and all that stuff. It's really, really difficult to the point where a lot of folks will just not venture out because they're so concerned about doing something that would be humiliating. So, Thank you. Yeah. Your explanation is very helpful. You're welcome. All right, so we know that OCD is really a big pain. That's what that slide said. <laughs> uh, what is not OCD? So you hear a lot of people talk about, you know, he's a compulsive this, she's obsessed with that, you know, and I've given you those definitions from a clinical sense but they do get kind of confused with some of these other things. So pathological gambling. Uh, kleptomania is individuals who steal things, right? So they go to the store and they take something. Um, certain substance use disorders and certain sexual behaviors. What's different about these is generally the behaviors themselves are not unwanted. They're not distressing. So people who gamble like to gamble. People who have the, you know, the, the stealing kind of concern, they get a high, they'll describe off as taking something. What they don't like are the consequences of those things. Right? They don't like losing money gambling. They don't like their spouse being upset with them because they've lost money. Person, people who steal don't like getting caught or being jailed or fined. So it's usually the consequences of those behaviors that's most distressing, not the behaviors themselves, which is again different from OCD where the thoughts and the compulsions are very bothersome and unwanted. Um, so as we say here, just because you do something over and over again does not mean you have OCD necessarily. It's that piece that's sort of unwanted, intrusive, and distressing. So the assessment of OCD, we've used the same measure now since the late 80s, early 90s, and it's called the Yale Brown Obsessive Compulsive Scale. And it's got two components to it. The first is a checklist of sorts. And it has different categories of obsessions and then different categories of compulsions, many of which I've already mentioned. So contamination thoughts and contamination behaviors. Uh, thoughts about doubt, did I do something or not, related to compulsions about, say, checking or reassurance seeking. And it's a way for a clinician to go through and ask questions about the more common types of thoughts and behaviors that accompany OCD. Now within that, everybody who has OCD, even if they have, they share contamination as being one of their problems, how that looks for that individual differs from person to person. It's amazing how very specific it is to each individual in terms of what their contamination fears are and what they have to do to manage that. So, it takes some time to really go to and ask those questions to really get to know a person with OCD and really understand their thoughts and behaviors. The second part of this, so after that checklist, we do a severity rating. And there's 10 items that we ask about. And we're asking questions first about the thoughts and then about the behaviors. And we're asking questions like, how much time do these thoughts take up every day on average? How distressing are they to you? How impairing are they? 
how difficult is it, or how uh, much do you try to resist them? And then related to that, how much control do you think you actually have? And so an individual's response to that gives them a score. And that score will range from, because there's 10 items, and 0 to 4, it ranges from 0 to 40. 40 being very, very extreme severity of OCD. Most of the folks that come to see us at Rogers will be in that sort of moderate to severe or even more severe range. So upwards into the 30s, for example. That means life is not going real well. Those thoughts and behaviors are taking up a lot of time. They're really distressing. I'm really not doing well. All right. So that gives you just an idea on that, that Y box, as we call it. Gives you an idea of the different sort of um, categories. So a lot of the folks that we see, and what usually brings people into therapy, is they're going to be into that sort of low 20s and up. That means, again, they're just not really doing, doing very well. You know, this is the, uh, used to be the million dollar question. I think these days it's going up. It's probably the 10 million dollar question, which is, what, what causes OCD, right? Wouldn't we love to know that? And we could just find sort of pill or something we could take and it would all be taken care of. At this point, we don't really know. We do know that, you know, OCD has a genetic component to it. So 20% of first degree relatives will have OCD. So when we're working with our kids with OCD, we know 20% of those, their parents are going to have OCD. So it tends to run in families. Uh, additional 15% will have what we call subclinical levels, meaning that we see that they have thoughts and behaviors, but it's just not getting in the way that much. And it does not appear to be learned, meaning if my parent has OCD and they're a washer, it doesn't mean that I'm going to learn to be a washer. I might have OCD, but I may express it in a completely different way. So parents, you don't have to feel like you, you can blame, blame, you have to blame yourself or anything if your child ends up with OCD. It's really not about alert behavior, it's really more about sort of the genetic piece to it. We certainly know that serotonin may play a role in this, in part because a lot of the medications that we have right now work on that serotonin, which is a neurotransmitter within the brain. And so uh, these uh, selective uh, serotonin reuptake, reuptake inhibitors, and I'll talk a little bit about Prozac as an example of that, uh, tends to work, and I'll tell you how well it tends to work in individuals with OCD. All right. So thank heaven I didn't have to remember that acronym, what that stood for, because I never do. But PANDAS, it sounds really nice, right? It sounds really like you just give it a hug, but you really wouldn't want to give it a hug. So PANDA stands for Pediatric Autoimmune Neuropsychiatric Disorders Associated with Strep. Essentially, they found that a certain percentage of cases of OCD, usually in childhood, maybe in the range of 5 to 10 percent, seem to have a sudden onset following a strep infection. So they're thinking that there's some sort of bacterial trigger, for example, that's associated with either strep or something similar to strep that may bring on a more sudden version or variation of OCD. What we found is that these individuals um, may respond, they may see some re symptom reduction when you give them an antibiotic, right? So you're treating that strep infection. Um, but we also know that that's usually not a complete treatment. So even if you recognize that it came on after a strep infection, doesn't mean that the antibiotic completely cures it. So people are left with residual symptoms oftentimes that still need these more traditional treatments that I'll talk about. And again, it is really just a small percentage of cases, but there has been a lot more research interest in this lately, and a lot, of, a lot more parents, as you can imagine, really kind of like this. Why do you think that is? Because it's a biological problem, not a psychiatric problem. And for many parents, that's easier for them to you know, be okay with than to think of it as a psychiatric. So they sometimes will persist with this, even though this may or may not be the issue for their particular child. With pandas, we see some fairly sudden onset symptoms. We think, see, see things like changes in eating, sensory issues, being more sensitive to certain you know, sights and sounds and things like that. Uh, really significant deterioration in handwriting, for whatever reason. Um, so all of a sudden, an uptick in like uh, uh, wetting themselves or wetting themselves during their sleep. 
onset of ticks, and then really being difficult to, for some of our kids, to separate from a parent. They just all of a sudden became very clean. And these symptoms really do happen very rapidly, where the child will begin to exhibit these things. And as I mentioned, even though we can use uh, antibiotic to treat some of these cases, if we think it's that, there's generally some uh, symptoms left over that we need to treat using our more traditional methods. So, what are the first-line treatments for OCD? Uh, medications, exposure and response prevention, or exposure and ritual prevention, or a combination of the two. Medication. So, the medications so far that seem to help and work on OCD are those that work, at least in part, on that serotonin neurotransmitter system that we talked about. So some of these things you probably recognize more by their brand name. So Prozac, you've probably heard of Prozac now for maybe a couple of decades. Luvox, Zoloft, Paxil. And then Clomipramine is actually a different kind of medication. It's an older tricyclic antidepressant. So when I started doing this, we used to have to import that from Canada, believe it or not, because we couldn't get it here in the United States. So that would have been the late 80s, early 90s. Um, Clomipramine is very effective. The problem with clomipramine for some people is there's a lot of side effects that they don't like. So we generally, as we'll see here, may start with uh, one of the other medications first, see what the benefit is, and then work ourselves into some uh, into process, excuse me, into clomipramine eventually. Um, in terms of effectiveness, the medications that I just listed, uh, with the exception of that clomipramine, generally work about equally as well. And it's very difficult to predict, you know, whether someone's going to benefit from one medication versus the other. Sometimes if you have a family member who's done really well on medication, psychiatrists will look at that and say, gee, your sister did really well on Prozac, you know, maybe we could try you on that because that, uh, there seems to be some familial benefit there in a sense. And overall, if we look across studies, if you just take the medication, there's about a 30% reduction in symptoms just from the medication alone, which isn't, isn't bad, right? So if you're kind of in the, in the low 20s and you're kind of that moderate level of severity and you can drop, you know, six, seven points, that's, you know, life is, you do better at that point. So it's not an insignificant reduction um, in uh, symptom severity and it potentially can have a very uh, strong impact on your quality of life if you can make that kind of improvement. Um, so a common medication strategy, so if you try one of those medications, you get the 30% improvement, terrific. If not, let's try another one, right? So maybe we try a blue box or we try something else. Do we still see an improvement? If not, we can try that in Afrinil, that clomipramine, that kind of older tricyclic that we talked about. And for a lot of people, that then will be the medication that seems to work for them. Again, the only downside being sometimes those um, co-occurring side effects that go along with that. But it's a bit of a cost-benefit decision that, that folks need to make with their psychiatrist or their physician. The advantages to using medication, it's easy to do, right? You just pop the pill in your mouth, take some water, it's easy to do. It seems to be effective, right? 30% reduction is pretty impressive. For the most part, we've got some fairly good long-term data on a lot of these medications that seem to be very safe. Um, it's accessible. So you don't really even have to work with a psychiatrist to get a prescription for one of these medications. You can work with your general physician if they're comfortable doing that to prescribe this medication. So it's accessible to a lot more people than the uh, cognitive behavior therapy that I'll we'll talk about. So potential side effects, nobody likes to think about those things, but they're there for these medications. Um, it can take a while for these medications to work which is where people get a little bit you know, antsy. So it can take up to 10 to 12 weeks for some of these medications to work. Um, and they also are prescribed at a higher dose when they're used for OCD than if they were prescribed for depression. So sometimes it just takes a while. Um, again, it rarely eliminates symptoms. Again, we expect that 30% reduction. And if you don't take the medications, you're generally not gonna see them, which seems to make sense. Okay. All right, so exposure and ritual prevention, or ERP, is probably the gold standard treatment at this point. It's a 
had a form of behavior therapy that was pioneered by a gentleman by the name of Victor Meyer back in the late 60s. And I think Victor Meyer was a World War II pilot for the Royal Air Force. And so he was a bit of a risk taker. So thank heaven for him because he uh, had a couple of patients that he worked with who had OCD. He was able to apply this kind of exposure-based intervention and he had pretty good success doing it. It had not been tried up to that point. Um, exposure and response prevention or exposure and ritual prevention is the same thing. It's based on the principle of habituation. And what I mean by that is that when someone has OCD and they touch something that's, let's say, contaminated, they get that feeling, right? My anxiety goes up, I've got germs on my hand, what do I want to do? I want to wash, right? So I wash or I wipe it on my, my pants, the germs are off my hand, <sighs> I feel better, right? And that's, uh, that's the compulsion. And that's what we call it negatively reinforced. What I mean by that is I take something that feels bad, the germs on my hand and the anxiety that went with it. I do my compulsion and I feel much better. So guess what I'm going to do next time I get germs on my hand and I feel anxious? I'm going to do my compulsion. Habituation, as we'll talk about in a little bit more detail, is a process where I go ahead and touch the thing that triggers my anxiety, touch those germs, but instead of washing or doing anything to get rid of those germs, I wait. And guess what happens? My anxiety goes down on its own without me doing anything. That's habituation, where I go from anxious to less anxious with nothing but the passage of time. I've just waited it up, basically. Now I'll go into a little bit more detail about that. Um, we're looking for a couple of things as well when we're doing this sort of work. Within trial habituation means what I just did. I touch something, I wait, my anxiety goes down. That's habituation within just doing it once. But what I also want is something we call between trial habituation. What that means is I'm going to ask the person that I'm working with to touch that same spot five times in a row. By the time they get to that fifth trial, their anxiety upon touching that um, surface won't be as high as when they first touched it. And they're still going to experience that reduction in anxiety. So what you see is from trial one, their anxiety might peak, let's just say, on a scale of one to 10. It might peak at a five. Trial two might still be a five. Trial three, it peaks at four. Trial four, it peaks at three. Trial five, it peaks at two. That's within, or excuse me, that's between trial habituation. Does that make sense? Okay. So, what we need to see happen when someone's doing an exposure, so when they're gradually kind of confronting these situations, is we need to make sure that three things are happening. One is, we need to make sure that that exposure is prolonged. So when we have somebody do an exposure, we really do have them do this. And they wait and they say, okay, my peak anxiety on a one to 10 scale is a five. Well, I don't want them to stop until that anxiety drops by at least 50%. So in that case, it would have to go to at least a two before they would be done with that particular trial. So we've got to make sure that they go through that process. The other thing is it needs to be repetitive. So just what I mentioned, we want them to repeat that exact same exposure five times, 10 times, whatever it takes. And we want them to make sure that they can see that as they keep doing it, it's just not as bad, right? That between trial habituation. The other thing that we need to see happen is it needs to be graduated, meaning we need to start sort of at a moderate level of difficulty. Unfortunately, what you'll see sometimes on TV and some of these shows that sensationalize the treatment is they have them do stuff we would never ask our folks to do. You know, they have them dip um, pieces of bread in toilet water and eat it. Well, we would never ask somebody to do that because that's really too much. That would be what we would call flooding. Uh, way too much. So there's a method to the way we do this. We do it in a gradual way, what we call challenging, but managing. I want you to experience anxiety. I want you to be challenged, but not overwhelmed. There's no data at all that says you have to throw somebody into the deep end for them to benefit. The gradual approach seems to work like a charm for almost everybody. Yeah? How do you deal with multiple obsessions? We just kind of go one by one. You know, so we come up with um, you know, different exposures for different obsessions, for example, depending on what it is that they're concerned about. And 
you know, those who, who do this, gentleman in the front row who does this, they come up with multiple different exposures. So our exposure hierarchy, as we call it, which is a list of all the different exposures that they're working on, could have 100 items, 200, 300 items on it. Because we really want to make sure that we're getting at all those different obsessions and dealing with all those different compulsions that they're presenting with. So it can take a little while right, for people to get through that list. But what you'll find is when people start making progress uh, on some of their obsessions, it does tend to generalize to other areas. So if somebody's you know, working on some contamination and making progress, that generally means that they're doing well with contamination in a, in a variety of other areas, you know, things that are of similar, dif uh, similar difficulty. All right. Ritual prevention. So we need both exposure and we need ritual prevention for this treatment to work. So it does me no good <laughs> to do this exposure, touching this thing, and then go and wash my hands. <coughs> I've kind of undone it. I've not learned what I'm supposed to learn, which is I can touch stuff like that and it's not going to hurt me. It's not going to harm me. I can live with it. So we got to make sure that they're not engaging in their compulsions or any other kinds of distraction or anything to reduce their anxiety artificially other than waiting for it to kind of come down on its own. So that's where that ritual prevention comes in very handy. So let me give you an example. So this is just anxiety levels low and high, and this is just the passage of time. So I arbitrarily pick 60 seconds there. So a typical OCD scenario, somebody comes in contact with something, let's just say they come in contact with a contaminated doorknob, well guess what, their anxiety's gonna go up, we would expect that. What they're gonna do then is they're gonna engage in some sort of ritual compulsion, same thing, and that generally is gonna reduce that anxiety pretty quickly, right? Sometimes it takes a little longer, but for the most part it works rapidly. The problem is, that process where I go from anxious to less anxious, as I mentioned, is reinforcing. It feels good to do that. So next time I feel or come in contact with something that triggers my OCD or anxiety, I'm going to have to do that ritual and get this kind of ongoing problem, right? So what do we do? So for exposure and, and response prevention, we work with our folks and we say, okay, let's come up with a whole list of exposures and we're going to pick something that's sort of in that middle range. And let's just say, just using a consistent example, it's touching a, a contaminated surface. But their anxiety is going to go up, hopefully not too high, right? Moderate levels. And then once they do that, we're going to ask that they do their best to not engage in a compulsion. And their anxiety will come down, but guess what? It might take five minutes, 10 minutes, maybe 15 minutes for that anxiety to come down by at least 50%, which is what we want. And that's that process that we call habituation. I've done nothing else but wait for anxiety to come down on its own, but just, just the passage of time. The beauty of this is this. As I continue to do those, that same exposure, what I find is that my anxiety doesn't peak as much, right? I kind of find it's getting easier. So not only is my anxiety not peaking anymore after I've touched that darn table multiple times, but even if I do get some anxiety, it goes away really quickly. That's what you're, you're making a fundamental change to your reaction to these uh, triggering kinds of situations or objects. So in terms of, you know, if somebody came in to work with a therapist who specializes in this, initial evaluation can take a little bit. So one or two hours, we really want to make sure that we understand your specific obsessions and compulsions and avoidance behaviors so that we can come up with the best treatment strategy. We um, confirm that diagnosis of OCD, right? There's a lot of misunderstanding of what it is and how it's diagnosed. Um, we want to look at major problem areas, so the contamination, checking, ordering, and arranging, those uh, uh, harming thoughts, sexual thoughts, whatever it might be. We certainly want to ask about comorbid diagnoses. We want to know what else is going on, right? Do you have other anxiety disorders or depression or something else that might interfere with your ability to to benefit uh, from treatment. And then, you know, kind of a key thing is educate our patients and family about OCD and treatment options. What can you expect? How are we going to do it? What's your role in this process? And here's the good news. You're most of it. 
your the biggest predictor of outcome is your willingness and and interest in working on these exposures and doing the treatment, which I think is great. I'd rather you have that responsibility than me have that responsibility. Therapists who do this are facilitators. We help you come up with the strategy, and then you go and practice it. I like that. So again, uh, getting a little bit more about the the, the, uh, the overall obsessive compulsive scale. Go through that. We're going to have our folks generate specific exposures for our patients to work on. We use a zero to seven scale where I work. That's unusual. Most people will use a one to ten or a, or a one to a hundred scale. That's probably more typical. And then we'll go ahead and create that exposure hierarchy that I talked about. We're going to have lots of items on there for folks to work on. Um, they'll never be at a loss for homework and things to work on outside of sessions. In terms of that treatment phase, so in, in sort of mild to moderate severity cases, um, a lot of those can be treated on a weekly basis. You go to see your CBT specialist, um, he or she will work with you, do all that evaluation, come up with the exposure hierarchy, do some stuff in session with you if you feel you need that, but then send you on your way to work on this stuff independently or with the help of a spouse or a parent or whomever you'd like to assist you. In, in moderate to severe cases, sometimes you may need more intensive treatment. So you just may need to have a therapist there more to help you, just more hours per day or per week to work on some of these things. Um, or you can also work with a therapist and see him or her multiple times a week, and sometimes people are able to, to, to work that out with you. Um, Dosage effect, generally the worse your OCD, the more severe it is, the higher dose you need. Yeah? So in terms of severity, how do you deal with patients who are so severe that they can no longer leave their home? That's a great question. Um, it's not uncommon in some cases like that for the therapist to go to the house to get someone started on therapy. So kind of what we would call a home visit. In many instances, that's the best way. And it's not just with OCD. Some people with like panic disorder or afraid to leave the house. And so we'll have the therapist come and do some work with them in the home, get their confidence up, make a little bit of improvement, and then be able to get them to you know, maybe a, an intensive outpatient program or a residential program where they can kind of continue on with the work. So that's generally, I think, one of the unique, unique benefits of working with somebody who specializes in this. They get that, they understand that, and so oftentimes they are able to do these kind of home visits to get people started so that they can begin that journey um, and get even higher levels of care from there. Does that answer that? Okay. Um, yeah, so dosage again, just as it gets more severe, sometimes you just need a higher dose of treatment. That's really all that is. There's not always anything magical to an intensive outpatient program or residential program. You just get more of the therapy, is really what it amounts to. But we do it in the same ways we would do it in an outpatient setting. Cognitive restructuring, so cognitive refers to you know, the thoughts or the maladaptive thoughts that people with anxiety or depression or other forms of uh, mental health issues may have that seem to, again, impair their ability to function fundamentally. We tend to try to assess for people's what we call errors in thinking. And oftentimes we focus on a couple of things with our with anxiety disorders. One is we call probability overestimation. So thinking that a dangerous situation is, is more likely than it really is. So you know, contracting AIDS from not washing hands, I may believe that that's really likely, even though it's not likely at all. <laughs> right? But somebody with OCD believes that based on the illness in part. The other thing is that sort of what we call catastrophizing errors. Um, I think the worst will happen. If I touch that doorknob, I'm going to get sick and die. Not just I'm going to get a cold, like many of us get during the wintertime. You know, there's going to be a serious consequence to me coming in contact with that. The other thing that we, we focused on, um, a maladaptive belief, is something called intolerance of uncertainty. Meaning, i got to be sure, i got to know. Uh, I'm not okay with not being, uh, with being uncertain. So I'm going to go back and check to make sure the door is locked if it takes me 50 times because I, I can't walk away feeling like I don't know. 
Fusion, yeah. or TAF, you know, some people will an acronym, there's another acronym for you, TAF. Uh, thought Action Fusion is just this idea that um, having a thought is, very, is, is equivalent to the behavior. So there's two forms of it. If I have a thought, let's say I have a thought about my parents dying in a car accident. Just me thinking about that, I think, increases the odds that they're now going to die, just because I thought about it. So there's some connection between my thoughts and an outcome. Right. The other version is something called uh, thought action fusion moral. And all that means is that having the thought is the moral equivalent of doing the behavior. Uh -huh. So if I have this thought about my neighbor that I don't like falling down in the ski slopes and breaking his leg, it's almost like me going to the ski slope and pushing him over. Right. That's how I kind of think about it. So I don't really, most of us think of thoughts and behaviors being very distinct things. Yeah. But people with OCD tend to equate them. Mm -hmm. They tend to think that they're very similar. So the magical thinking is often that belief that my thoughts will affect outcomes somehow. Okay. It's actually very interesting. Mm -hmm. Interestingly enough, just as an aside, there's something in the eating disorder world called thought shape fusion which is almost the same kind of thing, except that if I think about eating a really high fat, high calorie food, just thinking about that makes me feel like I'm gonna gain weight or that I have gained weight. So I think about eating a hamburger and I, all of a sudden I kind of go, oh geez, I feel bigger all of a sudden, you know, and I you know, pinch to make sure that I haven't gained weight and I might start engaging in some kind of behavior to start burning calories. It's that powerful. For some folks, so even with OCD or even eating disorders, you see that kind of magical thinking. All right. Um, effectiveness of ERP. If you remember, we talked about medications on average about a 30 percent reduction, 7.5 uh, point reduction on that Yale Brown obsessive compulsive scale. Here we see something closer to uh, certainly a 60 percent reduction, or nearly a 12 point reduction on that Y box on average, right? So, in other words, this seems to really do the trick, right? A 12 point reduction is a pretty significant um, reduction. You're going to notice a substantial improvement in your ability to function with a 12 point uh, reduction. The neat thing about this type of therapy in general, it's pretty durable, right? So, when you're working with somebody who does this, um, they want to make themselves obsolete. They want to teach you everything that you need to know that you can kind of continue on and do this yourself. So you can design your own you know, exposures if you want to. And because of that, because you're provided with knowledge and skills, you're able to con continue to use that moving forward. And so it tends to be very durable, a very, really durable treatment. People generally maintain their gains for the most part over time. That's pretty neat. Um, it's also the key to medication discontinuation if that's something you don't want to be on. So what happens is if people just take medication, and let's say they have an improvement in their symptoms, if they go off the medication without that exposure and response prevention therapy, what they see is a increase or return of their symptoms oftentimes. So in other words, sort of to keep that reduction, they have to stay on the medications indefinitely. If they do ERP therapy and medications, which are probably one of the more, more common combinations, and they made progress, and they say, you know, I don't like the side effects on this medication, we're a lot more confident than that they could go off that medication and maintain those gains, because they've learned something fundamental to being able to maintain what they've worked so hard to achieve. Advantages of exposure and response prevention, it's effective, right? So just talk about that. Uh, the only side effect, so to speak, is anxiety, well, for many of you. That's not a small side effect, right? Anxiety is really uncomfortable. Um, and we try to, again, do it in a way that's graduated so you aren't overwhelmed by those feelings of anxiety. You get just enough to help, and that's all you need. People can also experience quick improvements. Right? Once they finally kind of confront the thing that they're afraid of, they realize, hey, this isn't so bad. The worst thing didn't happen. 
and oftentimes they can make fairly quick progress in, you know, in lots of different situations. Disadvantages, it's hard work. Um, I remember, this could be an old statistic, but of the 100% of folks who are diagnosed with OCD, 25% right off the bat said, I don't want to have anything to do with exposure and ritual prevention. I do not want to experience that kind of anxiety. Okay, fair enough. But of the folks that do that, 80 to 90% see very significant improvement in their symptoms. In other words, if you're able to kind of push through and do it, you're probably going to see some pretty significant benefit. There's always residual symptoms, though, and that's with any anxiety disorder. And that's nothing that you should be afraid of. It's just that there may still be times when you have thoughts you don't want to have, may times when you check the door a few more times than you'd like. But generally, it's manageable. It's not as distressing. It's not interfering. You're basically able to function really well. But there may still be these symptoms that bother you from time to time. A bigger problem, well, non-compliance. If you don't do the work, you're not going to benefit. And the best CBT therapists in the world can't do your exposure work for you. So that's the downside. If you really have a problem with motivation, you know, it's going to be harder. But if you're able to do the work, do what your therapist is working, is, you know, suggesting for you, you should expect to do pretty well. Uh, but one of the problems is the absence of people who do this kind of therapy. Believe it or not, you're lucky. We've got a community that has lots of good outpatient therapists like uh, Damon Bucket here in the front row. Um, and also we've got, if you need a higher level of care, in our backyard we've got Rogers, right? So you can go there. So we're, we're lucky to have resources locally, but that's not the case throughout the country. We've got lots of spots where there aren't any really good qualified behavior therapists to do this. The other problem is some people say they do this, but the quality is not there. They really just don't have the training, they don't have the experience provide this in a way that's going to be ultimately effective. So I think on the IOCDF website, I can you correct me, there are questions on there that you can ask. We actually have a flyer up here too. Perfect. Uh, if you flyer, what is those for? We're looking for there. Perfect. Yep. So these are some of the questions that you want to ask to make sure that the person that you're working with knows how to do this treatment. Because it's, you know, it's your time and money and investment, you know, and you want to make sure that you get the most out of that. A couple of studies just to kind of compare some of these things. So Enda Foa is a big name in our field. She was one of the sort of pioneers of coming up with the treatments for PTSD, for example. But she's also done a lot of research with anxiety and OCD. She looked at about 150 adults, and she kind of looked at folks who were on just exposure and ritual prevention, just medication. There's that anaphronel, that medication I talked about with uh, more of the side effects. The combination of those things, and then placebo, which is just like a sugar pill, it doesn't have any real benefit, but sometimes people think that it's a real pill, and so they'll respond in a way just like as if, just as if it was a real pill. So it's a good way to kind of gauge the real effectiveness of these other treatments. Responders were those that were rated at a minimum much improved, and I apologize, I'm not exactly sure. I assume that's some sort of subjective rating that they came up with. So what she and her colleagues found was that exposure and medications, and certainly exposure and ritual prevention, were certainly both better than medication alone, and they haven't, they're better than the sugar pill alone. <laughs> She's like, phew, right? Um, but interestingly enough, there really wasn't a statistical difference between these two groups, meaning you took the medications and you did exposure, it wasn't really any better than just doing the exposure work. Okay? So, maybe if nothing else, that speaks to the power of the exposure-based intervention. So that's just kind of what it is. So, uh, medications in ERP, uh, ERP was similar to ERP. ERP was better than the medication, better than the placebo. Pediatric, so looking at kid population, or the POT study, pediatric OCD treatment study. And this is with, uh, you know, kids, 7 to 17, same sort of uh, arrangement here. The medication that was, this time is sertraline, so it's one of those newer antidepressant medications. And then, you know, the, the ERP alone, medication alone, the two together, and there's the placebo again. They looked at remission rates, so they said anybody that got to a, a child version of that Y-box, that's what the Cybox is, if they got to 
under 10, that was considered to be a remitter, meaning the symptoms just really weren't there almost at all. This is going to be a little deceiving because it looks like this is better than this. But statistically, you, you basically end up with the same findings that you did in the previous study with adults, which is, I think it's pretty much the same. <laughs> um, ERP was equal to the medications and, um, and the ERP. The, um, the combination was better than medication alone, which again, just like the last study. And thank heaven, the medication and the ERP were better than placebo. And then ERP alone was equal to, I'm trying to remember how this worked again. Um, ERP was better than placebo, and I think this was just for the remitters. I'm trying to remember now as I think about this. Um, yeah, so I think the bottom line here is that you can look at this as taking both medications alone, or I mean ERP alone, or the medications and ERP are going to be your best bet. What it's important to understand though here, this is a research study. These people are screened to be in these research studies. So these may not be always representative of the kind of folks that we might see, or we might see, meaning there may be more of a complex presentation that we see in our folks. For, and these folks may need the medications to really benefit, to be able to comply and do the therapy that we're asking them to do. So this is not an anti-medication sort of slide. It's really, based on this research, the power of medications and therapies is gonna work for a lot of people, but the ERP therapy is also very powerful in you know, just sort of alone. Okay, so I've got a few slides. I'm actually doing pretty well on time here, so have some questions ready for me. Um, family accommodation. Sounds kind of nice, right? Accommodation, you know, they're, they're helping me, or whatever it might be. Um, it's, it's, it's not, from an OCD perspective, from a treatment perspective, it isn't as helpful as it might sound. So accommodation probably is equated more with enabling, if that's a term that might be more familiar to some of you. So I just want to talk a little bit about what it is. So family accommodation is behavior on the part of the family. And again, this can be parents, spouse, siblings, aunts, uncles, grandparents, um, even coaches and teachers. Anybody who comes in contact with a person with OCD, child with OCD. And they'll engage in things like they'll help with rituals. I'll help the child bake. It takes them two hours to bake by themselves. I'll help them and maybe only take 30 minutes. I'll, uh, help them hand wash, I'll help them check the door locks, I'll help them check light switches before they go to bed, I'll help them check under the bed to make sure there's no one there, or whatever it might be. They may yield to the demands of the sufferer, whatever that is. They feel for the person who's dealing with OCD. So there's a tendency to kind of do what they want because they don't want them to suffer anymore. So the demand can be as simple as, simple as you know, go get this for me, to do my laundry, cook dinner for me, whatever it might be. And they'll willingly comply with that because they feel so badly. Providing reassurance. Again, reassurance is really an anxiety reducing kind of behavior. So people with OCD and anxiety will ask, you know, um, you know, mom and dad will be okay, right? The person will say, of course they'll be okay. And in the moment, just like a compulsion, that works. I, I feel better. The problem is I'm going to need to ask again and again and again and again. Assist with their complete tasks. So again, that could be doing their laundry, cooking, chores, whatever it might be. And then decreasing the person's responsibility because of OCD. So you don't have to do, you don't have to take out the garbage, you don't have to do your homework, you don't have to clean up your room, you don't have to do those things because I understand how difficult it is for you to deal with this. Families accommodate understandably because guess what? It's easier in the beginning. Especially if the symptoms maybe aren't as severe. You provide some of these accommodations, it seems to be okay, it seems to work. So in the beginning, you provide a little reassurance. The person says, okay, I can live with that, and they're able to move on. The problem is, it gets worse over time. It has to have more accommodations, more reassurance, and so forth. 
Family members also think it's helpful. Yeah. I mean, they look less anxious when I give them that reassurance, when I accommodate. They seem to be less anxious, and that's what I want. I want my loved one to not have to suffer. Um, you fear your loved one will feel unloved, right? I want my spouse to know that I love them and care about them and understand what they're dealing with. And if I don't do these things for them, they're not going to feel that way. I don't want that. Parents will feel guilty or mean, right? This is not the role of a parent. My role is to protect my child, to make them feel less anxious and distressed. Um, a lot of our parents and family members who struggle with their own anxiety may find it very difficult to tolerate a family member who has anxiety because of their own anxiety. Right? Your threshold for being able to deal with that is, is a lot lower. We also have the behavioral response. We've had a lot of parents say, if I don't you know, help uh, Johnny get ready in the morning, if I don't reassure him, he starts throwing things. He starts hitting things. And I got other kids in the house. I can't have that. I gotta do what I gotta do to make sure that he doesn't act out. And I'll do whatever it takes to make sure that that doesn't happen. The impact on the family, as you can imagine, over time is pretty significant. So it's certainly the more accommodation is linked to more family dysfunction and stress. Right? So lots of things change. A lot of time is spent for families engaging in these accommodation behaviors. Helping a child get ready in the morning may take a lot of time. Um, it may lead to unintended changes in the family routine. We'll often ask our families, when's the last time you and your spouse went out on a date? When's the last time you went on vacation? Had a meal together? Um, just kind of hung out, you know, watched, uh, watched fireworks or something like that. And they'll say, oh, we don't do that stuff anymore. A lot of our energy, a lot of our time is devoted to helping our child or my spouse who has OCD. Accommodation certainly impacts marriages directly and you know, via having a child who has that. No two parents, this is going to be a huge surprise to you, no two parents parent alike. And oftentimes what you see with OCD is one parent who sort of kind of over empathizes with that person or the child, for example, and will accommodate a lot more to ease their worries and anxieties. The other parent may be very rigid. Nope, this has to stop, we're not going to accommodate. Neither of those extremes is particularly helpful. Um, we have to kind of, as we'll talk about, kind of come together to work as a couple to help a parent or to work with a spouse, for example, who's dealing with this. It also reduces time available for parents to spend together, right? You have to cultivate uh, a relationship. And if you're spending so much time taking care of the, the child or somebody else in the family who's dealing with OCD, you may not have those times to reconnect. Accommodation also impacts other kids in the family. They generally will have worse mental health outcomes. So it's not uncommon for us to, to suggest to families that, you know what, you may need some family therapy. You may need to have that child go talk to somebody themselves to make sure that they can talk about some of their frustrations and so forth. And then certainly accommodation reduces self-care. So we oftentimes ask our families, you know, when's the last time you worked out? Exercise. When's the last time you went out on a date? When's the last time you went to a movie? When's the last time you went to you know, spend time with friends or family? And they just have they've gotten away from doing those things. So you may ask, what's the problem with accommodating? Well, lots of things. Um, it's certainly associated with poor treatment outcome in kids. There's not a lot of research, but the research that has been done with OCD is really with kids to see you know, how parents accommodating impacts how well they do in treatment. It generally doesn't predict you know, great outcomes if parents aren't able to successfully roll back some of those accommodations. Um, accommodation conflicts with what we're trying to do here with CBT. In other words, we want our kids, we want our adults to be able to experience the thing that they fear and learn that they can tolerate it, learn that the terrible things aren't going to happen, and if we provide them with reassurance, if we do things for them, they just don't learn that. They don't recognize that they can be okay. Um, and then certainly it can reduce a person's motivation to change. Um, it's not uncommon, and I, I, I work probably more with kids than I do with adults. But as bad as it is for some of these kids, the parents have accommodated to the point where they are literally laying on the bed watching TV, the parent has to come in and change the channel. 
because they can't touch the remote. Now you may think, what kind of life is that? But the kid may say, well, I'm also out of school. I can watch TV all day, you know, on, on balance. It's not terrible, but it's not great either. And so sometimes they really haven't experienced how bad it really is. And sometimes if they haven't experienced that, they don't then have the motivation. So they may end up sometimes going into treatment or coming to us, and they do realize for the first time how significant their OCD is. And that sometimes can spur them then to really work hard to get over this. We reduce the combination, we take the same approach that we do with exposure. We try to do it gradually. So we try to work with the person who has OCD, and as a treatment team come together and say, here's what's going on, here's why this isn't working, here's how we'd like to kind of start you know, reducing some of those accommodations. You're probably going to get upset and anxious, you're probably going to get mad at me for not providing that reassurance, but we're all on the same page working toward this then we call OCD and we're going to get you well. And we, we so want... Yeah. Are you working with the patient here yep, or are you working absolutely. with the family member? All of them. Oh. Yep. So we want family members, patient, therapist, all in the same room to talk about these things. So we're all on the same page. And it's also helpful too because we're really talking about defeating this common fault. We're all on the same page. We all want the same things. It's just that we haven't gone about it in a really great way to this point. So the therapist will help organize this, come up with a strategy and a plan, do the psychoeducation about why accommodation isn't helpful, and then come up with a gradual approach to begin to help family members reduce that, and then prepare the sufferer to know this is what's happening and this is why we're doing it. And we want them to be a part of this. We don't want to spring them. <laughs> we just don't think that's a really helpful way to approach it. So if they're on the same page with us, they're more willing to participate in this and able to tolerate that distress uh, more effectively. Okay, that's kind of a summary here. OCD, is, as we know now, is very common. It can be very debilitating, certainly, for, for many of our folks. We don't know what the, the cause is. There's no OCD gene yet that we've been able to identify, but we do know that biology does play a role in this. We do know that it's treatable, medications, exposure and ritual prevention therapy, or a combination of the two, seems to work very well. We also know that dose of therapy may need to increase depending on how severe the symptoms are or how complex the presentation may be. So maybe if someone has a lot of other things going on in their life or a lot of other co-occurring disorders that uh, need attention. And we certainly know that family accommodation can have a significant impact on the maintenance of symptoms, right? And so that we need to really be thinking about how are we going to roll that back, help families not accommodate, teach them that anxiety is not necessarily a bad thing. And if they're able to do that, what we find is that our outcomes tend to be much better. So families that come together, what we call family cohesion, is a good predictor, a positive predictor of outcome. But conversely, criticism and blame within the family is a predictor of poor outcome. So anything we can do to bring the family together to work with our person with OCD to help them move forward is going to be uh, something very fruitful that we want to do. So let's, let's see if I have resources. I have resources here as well. Obviously, you're familiar with IOCDF and OCD Wisconsin. Um, having worked in uh, British Columbia for a few years for my internship and postdoc, um, there's a very good site there called anxietydc.com, which is very focused on anxiety disorders. Lots of good materials and handouts and things like that if you're interested. And then Anxiety and Depression Association of America uh, is also a good resource. Um, IOCDF and ADA also have Find a Therapist, um, uh, sort of drop down list so that if you're, you're trying to help somebody find a therapist, it gives you some idea, some guidance as to who might be qualified to provide that service.